Um, so welcome to all of you, and welcome to this anniversary celebration of the Institute for Advanced Study. I'm Edward Witten in the School of Natural Sciences, and it's great that so many uh, old friends and colleagues have been able to come from many different places, and also to see so many of you from locally. So our speakers this afternoon are the two most recent faculty appointments in the school in physics and astronomy. So you'll hear more about Matthias Zaldriaga later, but I'll be introducing our first speaker, Nima Arkani Hamed. Nima received his PhD at Berkeley in 1997. He actually already became famous as a graduate student for his work on the possibility that the universe might have extra dimensions large enough to be detected of accelerators beyond the three space and one time dimension that we see in ordinary life. After postdoctoral work at SLAC and at, uh, being on the faculty at Berkeley, he was appointed professor of physics at Harvard in 2002, and he's been a professor in the School of Natural Sciences here at the Institute since 2007. His awards include the Grivlov Medal and the Sackler Prize. He's brought to the Institute an immensely fertile imagination and a wide range of interests. He has reinvigorated our efforts at understanding collider physics. He's brought a lot of new ideas on dark matter, uh, symmetry breaking, supersymmetry, how it might be realized in nature. Most recently, he's introduced a lot of exciting new ideas on a, a very rich topic that spans many of his interests from collider physics to string theory, the topic being uh, scattering amplitudes in gauge theory. But I think I'll turn over the floor now to Nima. I would also like to uh, welcome all of you uh, here to what uh, promises to be um, a uh, very festive uh, occasion, <clears throat> and um, uh, I want to be—I want to tell you about um, at least uh, uh, where I think fundamental physics is, is going. If not in the 21st century, then in the next few years. <laughs> um, uh, and so the plan for the talk is uh, to first set the stage. If we're going to talk about uh, the 21st century, um, uh, it's worth spending a, a few minutes recapping at least some of the most important things that we learned in the 20th century that we are trying to uh, build off of. And it, at a very, very broad brush level, um, the, 20th, the 20th century was all about the twin revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics and figuring out how to put them together and understanding that, that, that uh, the way they are put together uh, it is, gives rise to an amazingly rich, complex, diverse, interesting set of phenomenon that seem to be able to describe almost everything uh, we see in the world around us. And of course, we're interested in the things that it might not be able to explain, but also in further uh, understanding and uh, uncovering this very, very rich structure. Then I want to tell you about uh, at least two of uh, what seem to be very central mysteries uh, uh, in our understanding of, uh, of nature today. Uh, one of them has to do with the very basic fact that uh, that uh, the very arena of physics, um, talking about things happening in space and time, uh, the idea of space-time just cannot survive fundamentally um, and has to be replaced by something else. Space-time is, is almost certainly an approximate notion, and it's a very, very big question to figure out uh, what replaces it. It's a very big question because by dooming space-time, you are removing, apparently, the arena in which physics normally happens. Uh, and a, a second set of questions, um, and these may, these may well be tied to each other, uh, but a second set of questions has to do with another incredibly basic feature about the world, that despite the fact that it's governed by microscopic laws, microscopic quantum mechanical laws, um, we have a macroscopic universe. We have a big universe. It's one of the most salient facts about the world that it's big. And it turns out to be extremely hard in our current understanding of physics, just taking the laws that we know and love, to come up with a good explanation for why the universe is macroscopic. So um, that's another very basic question that uh, should have a good answer that we don't have a good answer to right now, and which fuels a lot of the current research. So I want to tell you about these questions and about some of the ideas uh, uh, associated with them. And uh, you know, these questions have been around and people have been thinking about them and there's been various degrees of excitement associated with them for the past 20 or 30 years. Uh, what's really particularly special about this epoch um, is, and especially this decade, is that uh, a, a hopefully new golden age of experiments is uh, upon us that should give us 
uh, a lot of new data that uh, uh, direct hints from nature that we haven't had uh, for a long time. And I'm talking about um, uh, most particularly in, and uh, uh, with at least the most potential is the Large Hadron Collider, but also there's a slew of experiments uh, uh, to try to detect uh, dark matter and a whole set of things about cosmology that I will, uh, which are incredibly exciting, but which I will leave for uh, Matthias to describe since he'll be talking about cosmology. Okay, so just to give a, uh, an idea of the kind of length scales that uh, we think about in the subject, here's a very, very broad brush um, a picture of the various distance scales we uh, think about in the nature. Here is the size of the universe around the Hubble scale, 10 to the 28 centimeters. That's on the large end of what we've actually also experimentally probed. Um, on the tiniest end of what we've probed is another length scale that, as we'll talk about in a bit, is actually an important invariant length scale that exists in nature. People have known about this length scale for 70 years. They knew that there was something going on at this distance of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. It's called the weak scale, the weak length scale. So this is where we're about to go to with the LHC. Okay? So that, that 10 to the minus 17 centimeters is around 1,000 times smaller than the atom, 1,000 uh, times smaller than the nucleus, around a billion times smaller than the atom. Um, okay, this is a gargantuan length scale. Um, and so anyway, th th uh, between these two lines is the boundary of what we understand, of, of what we've seen, uh, or, or what we're probing experimentally. There's a much, much, much tinier length scale, uh, the Planck length, around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, um, which we'll also uh, talk about. But one way of characterizing it is if you, if you just ask, if you, take, uh, if, you take, uh, if you take the force between two electrons at very large distances, that force, uh, the gravitational attraction between them is 42 orders of magnitude weaker than the electrical repulsion between them. But if you really take those electrons and force them to get closer and closer and closer to each other, um, uh, at some point, the gravitational force between them starts growing uh, in comparison to the electric force. Uh, and eventually, at this distance, around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters is when, when they all start becoming uh, comparable. Um, so this is a length scale associated with gravity. The fact that it's a number that's so tiny as a length compared to all the other numbers is a reflection of the great weakness of gravity uh, compared to all the other uh, interactions. Uh, but, but uh, it, it's at this length scale that, that we suspect that all sorts of puzzles and paradoxes associated with saying the words gravity and quantum mechanics together uh, kick in and make an appearance. It's arguments around this length scale that suggest that space-time doesn't make sense. We have to replace it with something else and so on. So these are sort of three interesting scales that we, uh, that, that we think a lot about, uh, a, a lot about in, in this business. So as I said, the, one, the first set of puzzles that I'll be talking about after review have to do with what's going on up here. And the second set of puzzles has to do with an incredibly obvious feature of this picture, which is that there are these incredible gaps. That the, this weak length scale is 16 orders of magnitude bigger than, as a length scale than the Planck scale. The universe is gargantuan compared to either one of these scales. So these enormous hierarchies. And you might think that this is not so hard to explain. You know, atoms are small and elephants are big, but we don't think of this as a central uh, mystery of modern physics. But it turns out this, act, this one actually is. It's very, very difficult to understand why there's a big macroscopic universe for reasons that I'll discuss. And even uh, and, uh, and, and coming up with an answer to it's such an incredibly basic question seems to, uh, seems to uh, involve a real set of uh, puzzles and, and paradoxes in our, in our current thinking that requires something beyond what we now have. OK, so here's uh, the uh, lightning review of the last, uh, of the last century. Um, and um, so uh, we started off with uh, special relativity. Um, I, I mean, uh, there's a common theme, not only in what happened in the last 100 years, but going all the way back to Newton and continuing to now, that as we learn more and more about nature, we find that different things, um, seemingly different phenomena, seem to be uh, different aspects of a, more, uh, of a more unified whole. And when that more unified whole is appreciated, other phenomena are predicted, which are not obviously related to either one of the first two, but which are nonetheless, uh, uh, nonetheless true and give us a deeper understanding of what's going on. So special relativity unified space and time. Just like we can rotate uh, space coordinates into each other by doing rotations in space, it's also possible to mix space and time coordinates with each other simply by uh, uh, moving at different uh, fixed, fixed velocities. 
So this unification of space and time, the fact that they could be mixed with each other, the fact that there are different aspects of the same thing, uh, was itself a, a remarkable, just kinematical fact about the world, and also unified many other things, energy and mass, electricity and magnetism. It gave, it gave rise to a, to, a, to, a, to a uniform explanation for many, many, many other things. The idea of general relativity was that space-time itself could be, uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't a static arena, but could be curved. The curvature was asso associated with, the, with gravity. And again, this idea that it could be curved had other consequences that were unanticipated. For example, when we talk about the expanding universe, to even talk about the expanding universe, it doesn't make any sense to talk about uh, an expanding universe. It's not expanding into anything. It's just getting bigger. There's more and more space that's being invented all the time as the universe expands. Uh, and that's not even something you can talk about if you have the standard uh, arena in which everything happens, picture of what space-time is. You know, when we say the universe is, is, is expanding, we imagine there's two galaxies here. Later, the universe is bigger. It's bigger because there's more space invented between the galaxies. Uh, and that's only possible because uh, space-time is really something dynamical. So again, not only did it explain uh, things that were known already, but it predicted other things that were really not obviously connected uh, to them. And uh, um, of course, another interesting theme that would make for a whole other talk is that often these predictions are so surprising that even the people who invent the theories refuse to really make them. So, uh, but, uh, th th and th this was certainly what one, one of the examples. We'll talk about another one in a second. This was such a surprisingly dramatic prediction that Einstein refused to make it. But it's really a basically inevitable consequence of his theory. So quantum mechanics unified, uh, amongst other things, uh, waves and particles. So there's no such thing as waves anymore. Everything in nature is a particle, but they're not classical particles, they're quantum particles. And sometimes large macroscopic collections of quantum particles behave as classical particles. And sometimes large macroscopic collections of quantum particles behave as classical waves. But there's just one underlying concept, that of a particle, which again, in various approximations, uh, led to the uh, diver the, the diversity of phenomena that were seen in the classical world. And uh, as, as amazing a development as relativity was, quantum mechanics is even more revolutionary. Um, it completely changed already once, a hundred years ago, what we think the purpose of physics is. Um, gone was the idea of uh, Laplace's dream of uh, uh, classical determinism, and, in and instead we're just left with the uh, uh, inevitability of, uh, of making statistical or probabilistic predictions about nature, uh, with things like the uncertainty principle uh, being uh, one of the hallmarks of this very, very peculiar fact about nature. We can't both know the position and momentum of a particle uh, at the same time, um, which is a prerequisite for being able to predict where it goes next if you have a classical picture of the world. Now, as I said, these, the, the synthesis of these two basic ideas, just of relativity and quantum mechanics, putting them together turned out to be a remarkably uh, challenging and interesting thing to do. And, um, and really, uh, quite surprisingly, we're still coming to grips with the, the full nature of what this synthesis can do and what, uh, and what sorts of phenomenon it can generate and what it can explain. Um, but it was not easy to put together special relativity and quantum mechanics. The synthesis of the two of them that was uh, uh, completed in the uh, early 1930s is called quantum field theory. And it has many remarkable consequences, but there's one of them that I want to highlight because it'll be important for some of the rest of the story. One of the amazing consequences is the existence of antiparticles. So if the world is both relativistic and quantum mechanical, necessarily antiparticles must exist. And uh, this is a, a, a sketch of an argument for, for why this is, which is commonly given. There, there are holes in this argument, but it suffices for this, uh, for this purpose. <clears throat> if you imagine, the, th this is, a, this is a, a sort of classic space-time picture that you're familiar with when you study, uh, uh, if you study uh, special relativity. Um, so imagine this is an axis in, in one dimension of space uh, and dimension of time. Light would move on 45 degree lines. Uh, in this picture, a particle that's just sitting at rest would just sit here and move on and on and on. A particle that's moving a little quickly would just, you know, would, would move on, along a line like that. A particle moving at the speed of light would move right along at this 45 degree line. But imagine that something could go faster than light. So imagine you had something here and you shoot it and it goes faster than light, so at a more than 45 degree angle here, uh, and it makes it from the point A to the point B. You open up textbooks and they tell you that this can't happen because if it did happen in, uh, 
if, if, if it did happen, it would be possible to violate causality. And the argument is that in another frame of reference, in a sufficiently boosted frame of reference, you could make that event B uh, happen before the event A, so it looks like you're sending a signal backwards in time from the point A to the point B. That's what a classic reason in classical relativity why it's impossible to transmit signals faster than light. It's simply inconsistent with causality. On the other hand, in a quantum mechanical world, we can't be precisely sure where this event took place. There's always some small chance, in some sense, that it, it, it actually took place a little bit over to the side, and it really did make it from A to B in a way that appears causal, but you actually can't tell. You can't tell if it went from there, you can't tell from where exactly it went from. So there is some frame in which it might look like the inference went, uh, where well, the signal went back in time. The only possible way to rescue a causal interpretation for what's going on is to say, no, 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 there's no negative charge going back in time from A to B. Instead, there's a positive charge flowing forward in time from B to A. So this is forced on you. It's forced on you if you try to make uh, quantum mechanics, causality, and relativity all consistent with each other. But that means that there must be something out there. There must be a particle out there in nature with all exactly the same properties as the electron, but with opposite charge. So you could have this interpretation. So that's why, uh, that's at least a cartoon of an argument why relativity and quantum mechanics together force the existence of antiparticles. Another example of a case where the prediction was too dramatic for the, uh, for the author of the theory to make, in this case Dirac, really refused for a long time, at least three years, to, uh, to actually say that his theory predicted that this antiparticle existed, despite the fact that it does, and it's, uh, and it's correct and it's out there. So, um, this is, this, is, this is really fascinating because this extension of our notion of space and time that was given by Einstein, combined with quantum mechanics, doubled the world. It meant that there had to be a whole other set of particles out there that had never been seen before until they were. Um, but, uh, but it's just an inevitable consequence of uh, this extension of the notion of space-time uh, given by Einstein combined with quantum mechanics. I go through this uh, example here because uh, when we come later to talk about supersymmetry, we'll see that there's an almost literal exactly same set of words that we will say associated with that, that picture of the world. All right, well, one of the important consequences of the existence of antiparticles is that uh, space-time keeps acquiring more and more structure, okay? So uh, beforehand, Newton, it was this uh, static, uh, arena in which things took place in space separately from time. In special relativity, space time get mixed up with each other. It's still a static arena. In general relativity, it can, it can have some dynamics, it can stretch, that's associated with gravity. But still, there is a notion of emptiness. There's a notion of there being nothing. And this combination of quantum mechanics and relativity even removes that. So even the vacuum has some very interesting structure. The reason is, if you try to check whether some region of space time is empty, so, uh, as I'm sure you've seen, all my drawings are terrible. So you'll have to, uh, you'll have to put up with uh, this being a magnifying glass a number of times, okay? <laughs> uh, so um, so I, I apologize. Um, but uh, anyway, if you take that magnifying glass and you look at a little region of space to try to verify that it's empty, uh, the problem is that because of the uncertainty principle, you have to put some minimum amount of energy into that region of space. And as that as the size of that region gets smaller and smaller, you've got to put more and more energy into the little region of space you're trying to verify is empty, until you put so much energy into that little region of space that nothing can prevent you from for producing an electron, and it's anti-electron. You conserve energy, you conserve charge, you conserve everything. Without antiparticles, that wouldn't be possible. But with antiparticles, it's perfectly possible. You conserve energy, you conserve charge, you conserve everything. So the act of trying to verify that the vacuum was empty yields an electron-positron pair. Any experiment that you might want to do that would check that some region is empty will produce particles. Okay? The world is quantum mechanical, so it won't do it the same way twice. Okay? So you'll get a whole distribution of different things coming out. But whatever is out there, you will eventually see it if you use a fine enough magnifying glass. So if you had this uh, picture of, of an electron with all these lines of electric force coming out of it, that picture is really not quite right. Uh, it's not, it, it, there isn't emptiness surrounding it. As you go to shorter and shorter distances, you, you find that it's, uh, if you did any experiment to probe what's going on there, you would find uh, evidence for particles and antiparticles, uh, which we picturesquely say are popping in and out of the vacuum at all times. Uh, but that picturesque notion is really a stand-in for the fact that if we do any experiment, we'll see every now and then, oh, an electron-positron will come out. Or if I, if I look at even shorter distances, 
using higher energies because of the uncertainty principle, a muon and anti-muon would come out. Or other particles, anything that's out there with a sufficiently strong uh, magnifying glass, uh, we would see. Um, often people describe uh, large accelerators, like, like the uh, Large Hadron Collider, as the world's most powerful, uh, as the world's most powerful microscopes. And you might, want, you might imagine what the microscope is looking at. It isn't looking at a cell or a piece of hair or something like that. It's looking at the vacuum. So it's the most powerful microscope looking at the vacuum. And again, because the world is, is quantum mechanical, it's actually taking a snapshot of this uh, roiling mass of stuff going on at all times. It doesn't look the same way twice, um, but uh, we learned something about the properties of the vacuum by, uh, by building these gigantic accelerators. Uh, all of these developments, putting together quantum mechanics and relativity, this basic rubric of quantum field theory, culminated into the 1970s into a very specific quantum field theory that uh, uh, people found actually described all the particles interactions that we've seen. Um, it's overly modest name, um, if, if, it was, uh, if it was in this epoch, it would have been called the most super duper theory of everything. <laughs> but back then it was called the standard model. Um, and, uh, um, and it's really a stunning accomplishment. Um, uh, it, it is just realizing that putting together quantum mechanics and relativity goes shockingly far. We didn't really need in the end to change in any fundamental way the rules that were handed down to us by Dirac, Born, Heisenberg, and all their friends. Taking those rules very, very seriously and figuring out all of their, their consequences and pushing it as much as possible um, this very specific quantum field theory was described that really describes, describes everything in a really remarkable way. So every interaction between uh, uh, every, uh, every, all particles and all interactions are associated with little stick figures like this. Um, uh, the electromagnetism is associated with a, a little a stick figure representing the interaction of electrons with a photon. The weak interactions responsible for radioactivity are associated with exactly the same kind of stick figure, giving us interactions between electrons, W particles, and uh, neutrinos. The strong interactions, quarks and gluons, there are some detailed differences. The gluons interact with each other, the photons don't, and so on. But in the end of the day, there's, there's uh, one basic common mathematical structure that really allows us to describe everything. The remarkable thing is that this structure only became manifest, and this great similarity between these different uh, uh, interactions only became manifest at short distances, at distances around 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. In a sense, that's because of, uh, because of some, um, some, from the short distance or high energy point of view, not particularly fundamental differences between them. Uh, that the, the, uh, the uh, W particle, for example, has a mass. Um, it, it can only travel around 10 to the minus uh, with a characteristic distance around 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. Uh, the photon is massless and can propagate over very, very long distances. From the point of view of a very short distance, uh, the very short distance uh, physics, that's not a very, very big difference. Uh, from, the, f from our point of view, where we live at very long distances, it's an enormous difference. But it's only illusory. This difference between them is simply because we we're stuck for 2,000 years, uh, only being able to probe distances much longer than 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. And this fundamental similarity between all the interactions only became apparent when we went to short enough distances. That's the reason we do particle physics. Uh, at least uh, the, 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 there's a way of talking about the subject, which is about uh, figuring out the building, ultimate building blocks of matter and, and, and uh, words like that. At least I don't find that kind of argument very, very compelling. Uh, the sort of Russian dolls all the way down picture of the world isn't necessarily all that interesting. Uh, the real reason we do it is because we've learned through experience over and over again that this essential unity and simplicity of the laws, the fact that they all look the same, that we can even contemplate them all looking the same really for the first time, becomes apparent at short distances. That's why we go to short distances. We want to learn something about the laws, not necessarily the sort of a, a sweet and spectrum of particles uh, that are there. There's one thing which is left in this picture. Um, so I told you that this theory, uh, uh, every, in principle, anything at, at sufficiently long distances, 10 to the minus 16 centimeters and longer, is incorporated in it. For example, you can ask, why does a particle like the electron uh, have a mass? It's very important the electron has a mass. If it didn't have a mass, atoms wouldn't exist or would be infinitely big. So this is, a, again, a very basic feature about the world. Why, why do atoms have a finite size, small size? Why do electrons uh, uh, have a mass? 
Uh, this, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, not only uh, can't I give a good explanation in a short time, I actually don't know a good explanation uh, to give at this level. Um, uh, but, uh, um, but I'll tell you the, the, the sort of standard picture people draw. Is, is to say that, to imagine that the world is filled with some kind of, uh, of is, world is, is filled with some kind of fluid or, or condensate, and that the electron as it moves around bangs into this condensate every now and then, and that's what gives it uh, its uh, inertia. Other particles bang into the condensate um, with greater strength and are therefore heavier, like the particles like the top quark, whereas the photon, for good reasons, has no interaction at all with this and therefore is exactly massless. Uh, I don't like that way of describing things because it makes anyone uh, think and ask about the ether. <laughs> Isn't this just like another ether? And the best I can say is it's a condensate that's not like the ether. <laughs> uh, um, it looks exactly the same to all observers, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it would be nice to have a, a better explanation um, uh, but, uh, to, to give at this level. Unfortunately, I, I don't have one. But anyway, it might suffice. Uh, um, for these purposes. Anyway, the typical length scale of these interactions, the typical distance these things go before they bang into this condensate is around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. So I told you this number 10 to the minus 17 centimeters is actually a length scale in nature. It has some meaning. Um, this is a fact about the world, that particles moving around interact with this condensate every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters or so. This would have been a fact, it was a fact 700 years ago, it'll be a fact 3,000 years from now. Um, but it just so happens that we're living in that epoch where we're about to probe experimentally this distance of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. So, uh, and that means that uh, we'll put, by banging things into each other, by, uh, 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 by probing these short distances, we'll put little ripples in this condensate, the typical wavelength of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And those will be interpreted as a production of new particles, excitations of this uh, condensate. That's the uh, infamous Higgs that everyone keeps uh, talking about and which I've bet a year's salary uh, will be seen. Unfortunately, I did that in jest, and I still get every week now, with in uh, alarmingly increasing frequency, emails from around the world of people willing to take me up on this bet. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'll, I still make it. But uh, the, the, this, the Hagues or something like it really must, must be seen. Um, uh, otherwise, very dramatic things, uh, quantum mechanics is wrong. Uh, so that's, that's not going to happen. All right, so that was, uh, that was a lightning review of the last 100 years, um, uh, setting, setting the stage for what we now think of as some of the uh, uh, main challenges. So let me first uh, talk about the trouble with space-time. The trouble, once again, has to do with my magnifying glass. Um, so let's say we want to, uh, so, so quantum mechanics told us that we can't talk about positions and the velocities of particles at the same time. But we can certainly talk about arbitrarily short distances if we like. All we have to do is use higher and higher energies by the uncertainty principle to probe what's going on at shorter and shorter distances. And sure, we'll make particles and antiparticles, we'll see what's going on. In fact, that's what it means. We'll probe what's going on at shorter and shorter distances. We just need a more and more powerful magnifying glass. We beg for more and more money from big government, and hopefully they give it to us, and we, we, we keep going. But uh, there doesn't seem to be any obstruction just from this argument, just relativity and quantum mechanics by themselves don't give you an obstruction to going to arbitrarily short distances. But gravity, relativity, and quantum mechanics do give such an, do give such an obstruction. And the reason is that at some point, you put more and more energy into a smaller and smaller region of space. Now, you know what happens. So E equals mc squared. So that energy has some mass. It has some gravity. And you know what happens if you put too much mass into a fixed region of space. It'll eventually have so much gravity that nothing can escape from it. It collapses into a black hole and you can't see anything about what's going on inside. So that's exactly what's going to happen to us here. Uh, we are trying to probe what's going on at shorter and shorter distances. We put more and more energy into a smaller and smaller region of space, until at some point there was so much energy into such a small region of space that what we're trying to look at and see the inside of and probe the inside of actually collapses into a black hole, so we can't do it anymore. You can ask, when does that happen? That happens when the distances we're trying to probe is around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So this means that, now, what happens if you say, shoot, uh, I'll just try harder. I'll build a bigger accelerator, a more powerful microscope. I put even more energy into that region. What will happen? You'll just make a bigger black hole. So, so every attempt at pro probing what's going on inside is foiled. 
And in fact, if you go to even higher and higher energies, instead of probing shorter and shorter distances, you make life worse for yourself. You can only have access to longer and longer distances because this black hole gets bigger and bigger and obstructs you from seeing more and more of the region you were trying to look at. So normally, of course, you could always take the attitude that, that those short distances in space and time are really there, we just can't measure them. Uh, but every time this sort of thing has happened to us before in physics, it has meant that the quantity we're trying to describe actually doesn't really exist. Okay? So the thing that we're trying to characterize doesn't really truly fundamentally exist. In this case, what's disturbing about it is the thing that doesn't fundamentally exist is the space and time itself. So that means that, again, it's the end of this, it's the end of short distance physics. Space time has got to come out from something, but how? So this is, this is the subject of uh, uh, it's one of the many aspects of the problem of putting uh, quantum mechanics and gravity together. Again, this would make for an entire uh, talk or sequence of talks uh, um, by itself. But uh, to uh, briefly summarize the situation, uh, in all the years that anyone has thought about it, the only idea that makes sense, um, that even begins to make sense for abridging this divide, um, are the various, uh, or, or the collection of ideas revolving around string theory. Um, so, in the original picture in the 80s, the idea was that particles weren't points but little loops of string, which might be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters or a little bit bigger, but somewhere, somewhere around there. And later it was realized that it's not really, even though it's still called string theory, it's not a theory of strings. There's uh, all sorts of other objects in it, um, higher dimensional objects as well. Uh, it involves many, uh, many ideas beyond things that we've seen, including extra dimensions of space. Very importantly, the idea of supersymmetry was born in string theory. It's, uh, it's a very, very important uh, element of it. We'll come back to talking about it in a second. Um, but again, the original, the, the, the original idea was, roughly speaking, that, that, that the particles are, are loops which are a little bit bigger than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, and they can interact nicely with each other. And these little black holes that we're talking about would be smaller than the loop of string and wouldn't eat it up. Okay, so there was some sensible way in, uh, of uh, imagining these uh, uh, slightly bigger than Planck length strings interacting with each other in some meaningful way. And later, that idea got uh, greatly, greatly generalized. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the really remarkable things happened in the mid-90s, um, what's called the duality revolution, that in fact there was one underlying theory, um, one underlying inherently quantum mechanical theory that has many, many solutions and many, many different classical limits. So amongst other things, it, 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 it uh, exploded the idea that you start with a classical theory and you quantize it. There's one underlying quantum theory with many, many interesting different, uh, uh, different classical limits. And uh, the collection of these things uh, evolved into the, the, most, the most interesting statement of all, um, which was that at least in some circumstances, what we used to think of as deep, mysterious, complicated, um, uh, dynamics of quantum mechanics and gravity um, in, in, in a d plus one dimensional world, let's say quantum gravity in a four dimensional world, was in fact exactly equivalent to what seemed like a more boring, completely understood theory of ordinary particles and forces, uh, quantum field theory. Just the same kind of theory we talked about, the people invented in the 1930s. <laughs> Okay, just putting together quantum mechanics and relativity, ordinary particles, nothing fundamentally mysterious about it. Um, but that theory in lower dimensions was equal to a theory of quantum mechanics, gravity, strings, extra dimensions, the whole shebang in higher dimensions. And again, this is something that would take a whole talk uh, all by itself to describe in, in detail, but the slogan is very important. Um, so, uh, of course, it's not, a complete, it's not a totally random theory of quantum gravity, it's a theory of quantum gravity that lives in a particular kind of negatively curved d plus one dimensional space. But in a very specific sense, everything that's going on inside that d plus one dimensional space is entirely describable by some completely ordinary quantum field theory. Not completely ordinary, it's in, in some relatively extreme region of its uh, parameter space, but still, something you could, in principle, put on a computer, we understand it well enough, we could simulate, it's all completely understood physics. This completely understood physics is, is totally equivalent to this very, very mysterious uh, and ununderstood physics. So this is just the, is an incredible fact, uh, I think completely, completely un unanticipated incredible fact. Um, and it's had many, many ramifications. Another way of saying the slogan is that string theory, quantum gravity is particle physics. Okay. So 
these, these, these ideas that seem to be very different are actually very intimately and deeply related to each other. Uh, now, of course, th this is the invariant physics statement. Uh, there is a less interesting but uh, amusing sociological fact associated with this, that since this realization, uh, there aren't really different camps in theoretical physics anymore. <laughs> it, there's, uh, there aren't string theorists and particle theorists. And there's one big structure, good ideas in theoretical physics. <laughs> okay? And that structure has many different facets, and you can work on different parts of it, but it's all connected. Um, and it, it, it's, it, you can really see it in the way, in, in the way that the field developed since the uh, late, late 90s. Really, there's one, uh, we're, we're much, much more one big happy family than, than, than was the case in the uh, 1980s. Well, I should say, of course, there are still people who do bad theoretical physics, uh, <laughs> but they're not at the Institute. <laughs> so all good ideas in theoretical physics are combined in one very big structure that no longer is there such a big difference between strings, uh, quantum field theory, there is just some, what's, what's incredible, this is what I mentioned uh, in the beginning, what's incredible is that this theories, this class of theories that were basically invented by our friends in the 1930s have so much richness and structure in them that they're capable to do this. Okay? So that's really telling us, that's really telling us something extraordinary about, about nature. So of course, in, in, this, in this area, there's still an enormous amount to understand. Um, what I told you really solves the problem of quantum gravity in this particular kind of space. Um, um, amongst the people who do bad theoretical physics are the people who don't actually believe that this problem is solvable, but it's actually been solved <laughs> in one class of situations. It's just done. It's good to know that problems are solved so you can move on to unsolved problems. Uh, but there are many problems that are not solved. We don't understand uh, some of the most interesting questions where these issues should become significant. What happens near the beginning of the universe? What happens at the Big Bang? Um, what happens near the center of black holes? How do we think about cosmology uh, combined with quantum mechanics more generally? There are lots of very, very deep conceptual problems that, that uh, in many of these problems, we don't even really know how to make a, uh, make, make a reasonable start. For some of them, we do, and so people have been making a start. And something else I told you is that uh, uh, one, of the, one of the most remarkable things that came out in the mid-90s was that there was one quantum theory with many, many solutions and many different classical limits. But that raises the possibility, which one of all these many, many solutions are we? So that's, that's another very important question to which we don't have an answer right now. And finally, along the lines of what I was advertising, uh, understanding, fully understanding, uh, putting together quantum mechanics and gravity should tell us what, how to replace the notion of space-time. But this picture, uh, while it very beautifully told us how to generalize the notion of space, how to, or how to generate space, did not tell us uh, where to get time from. So understanding where, where time comes from is uh, another uh, a very important open challenge. All right, so that was one set of questions. Now let me move on um, uh, to describing the second set uh, of important challenges, which is the question of why there is a macroscopic universe. Um, so let's go back to this, uh, let's go back to this picture that we learned because of special relativity and quantum mechanics uh, that uh, the vacuum is exciting. We use a magnifying glass to see what's going on at short distances. We see that it isn't empty. It's roiling with particles and antiparticles, and so on. Um, now, that's, that's, that's a very important fact. It's an experimentally true fact. Uh, it has many, many consequences. It's been checked to death. Uh, I should have mentioned it, but this theory makes, uh, the, the, well, at least the specific quantum field theory that describes nature, exactly these kinds of effects of particles popping in and out of the vacuum allow us to predict uh, to, uh, to predict things about the magnetic properties of the electron, for example, that are accurate to 12 decimal places. So this is not, uh, this, this really works. So th this stuff is real. Um, but it does have a disturbing consequence. Um, the vacuum is exciting, but it's actually too exciting. Um, and it's really a very, very basic problem that has, uh, uh, and it's the same problem over and over again. It has a number of different manifestations. So let me, let me tell you, uh, let, me, let me tell you how it works. So again, this is a cartoon of what's going on. Imagine you have a box, and in this box you have a certain size of these vacuum fluctuations. Okay? So there'd be some char certain characteristic size of these energies associated with the particles and the antiparticles or anything else that's going on in, in that box. Okay, let's make the box smaller. A smaller box, by the uncertainty principle, has even bigger and bigger fluctuations. 
Right? So if you look in smaller and smaller scales, there's even bigger and bigger fluctuations. You make, keep making the box smaller and smaller, you have gigantic size fluctuations, which should be associated, amongst other things, with some energy. Okay? So there, there should be some, some energy contained in these quantum mechanical fluctuations. That energy is huge. The bigger and bigger it is, uh, the smaller and smaller I make the size of the box. So this should, by all rights, uh, give you some energy density in the vacuum, which is gigantic. Okay? Uh, in fact, how it looks like it could be infinite, because I could make this box smaller and smaller, and, make this and just make the energy in each cell bigger and bigger. So the energy density looks like it's going to be infinity. Well, OK, uh, that, that doesn't sound, sound so good. Uh, well, at least it's probably not true that, it, that it's infinite. Because we just finished saying that because of uh, quantum mechanics and gravity, I can't make, I can't talk about distances that are way too small. I can't talk about things much smaller than this Planck length, for example. But you would still think that you can get an estimate for the size of the amount of this energy by just making the box, uh, by taking it down to a distance that's comparable to the uh, Planck length. That would give you some estimate for the energy density in the vacuum, um, which we don't have to put in numbers. The only word that made an appearance anywhere here is Planck. So it'll be Planckian, okay, some Planckian uh, energy density. In a world without gravity, the absolute energy of the vacuum doesn't mean anything. You can, uh, as you, any of us learned in high school, you can add and subtract anything to the energies, only energy differences matter. But with gravity, that's not true. With gravity, again, any energy, any energy density gravitates. And what we'd expect this huge amount of energy density to do is to give rise to some curvature of space and time. How big should that curvature be? Again, we don't need to do any equations. Every single word that made an appearance here was Planck. So the strength of gravity is set by this Planck length and Planck scale. This is Planckian. You would expect this curvature to be of order 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So just this naive argument, this back of the envelope estimate for the amount of energy density stuck in the vacuum would lead you to suspect that the world is curved to a really, really tiny size of around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Or maybe that it's expanding really, really fast, but doubling in size every 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Okay. Neither one of those things looks anything like the world we see. This nice, big, macroscopic, flat universe, it's 10 billion years old, we can walk around in it, everything's fine. Uh, that looks absolutely nothing like what we predict from the simple back of the envelope estimate. So um, I used to say that, that so if, if you just ask, how much bigger is this uh, energy density of the vacuum um, than uh, what would be even roughly consistent with what we see in the world around us, it's numerically around 120 orders of magnitude bigger. So I used to say that uh, uh, this factor of 10 to the 120 was the biggest uh, disagreement between the back of the envelope estimate and experiment in the history of physics. And then I realized there's no reason to slander the other sciences. I don't think anyone has screwed up by 10 to the 120. <laughs> so it's really the biggest disagreement between a basic estimate and reality ever. Um, and it's, it's an attempt to answer a really simple question. Why is the universe big? We have a very hard time understanding why the universe is big. In fact, in the late 90s, uh, as perhaps Matthias will uh, 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 talk about, um, one of the most exciting experimental discoveries of the last 20 years is that the universe is accelerating. The universe is actually doubling in size at a uniform rate. And it's completely consistent. In fact, the best explanation is that there is an energy density in the vacuum, but the size of the energy density is 10 to the minus 120, <laughs> what we would expect from this estimate. So what we do, so I, I said this theory is wonderful. It explains everything. There's nothing contradicting it, and it's true. But what we do is simply the following. We say, aha. This is one contribution to the energy density of the vacuum. There is another one, and it just so happens that if, let's say, working in Planck units, this contribution was 1.784639, et cetera, going out to 120 decimal places, then the second contribution just so happened to be negative. 1.786, exactly the same for 120 decimal places, and then they begin to discrete in the 121st decimal place. That sounds completely nuts, <laughs> but it's actually what we do. Okay? That's what we actually have to do to accommodate this very, very basic fact uh, that, that the universe is big. It looks like a very fine adjustment of the parameters, accurate to one part in 10 to the 120, uh, in order to accommodate this very, very basic fact. 
This problem is so general that it has other cousins. They're not numerically as, as severe, although they're, they're, they're pretty severe. Remember I told you the reason the electron has a mass is because it moves around and bangs into this condensate every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters or so. Okay, well this condensate, like everything else, everything out there, it suffers these gigantic quantum fluctuations that are bigger and bigger at shorter and shorter distances. So there too, that, 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 that condensate should, should have these roiling huge quantum fluctuations down at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. The typical length scale of the electron should be traveling should be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Um, if that was the case, the electron would be so much heavier, we'd all be so much heavier, we'd all be black holes, it would be a horrible, un unpleasant world. <laughs> again, that looks absolutely nothing like our world. It's the same basic question over and over again. Why, when there are these gigantic quantum fluctuations in the vacuum, why is there any macroscopic world at all? Why do things look, why is there any macroscopic correlations that make any sense at all when, uh, when there's huge quantum fluctuations at very, very short distances? So uh, this is, uh, as I hope, uh, the, the, the second problem that I mentioned, we also address in our theory by taking two parameters and now adjusting them not in the 121st decimal place, but in the 33rd decimal place. <laughs> okay? But it's still equally ridiculous. It makes us think that we're missing something, something very, very big. Because the problem is so simple to say. So, so there's a very simple to say problem. It's not associated with some esoterica of the subject. It's a, it's a direct consequence of this union of relativity and quantum mechanics. Uh, but this direct union seems to make it naively impossible to have a macroscopic world unless the parameters are incredibly adjusted. Now, since the problem arose from uh, our union of space-time and quantum mechanics, um, it maybe stands to reason that if you're going to solve any of them, that you need some extension or modification to one of those two ideas. No one has ever managed to make any modification of quantum mechanics that makes any sense. Um, but, uh, but there have been approaches to these problems, and the only ones that do work, in one guise or another, involve some extension to our notion of space-time. They, they, they actually change and extend what we mean by, by space-time. It's a little ironic, because I told you earlier that space-time itself has got to go out the window. <laughs> what I'm telling you now is that before it goes out the window, it has to be modified first. <laughs> okay? So it's got to be modified in some way that's still recognizably space-time. Um, some with some extra bells and whistles, and then that whole thing is going to go, go out the door eventually. But first, we have, we've got to understand what this uh, modification is. Again, really, there's, there's basically two ideas for what could be uh, solving even a subset of these problems. But the only idea that has a chance, and in some limit, actually does exactly solve both of them. It's not a limit that happens to describe the real world, <laughs> but it really have, has a chance to address all of them, um, is the notion of supersymmetry. Which, uh, which augments our uh, normal ideas of space-time by saying that in it, if you want to label a point in this uh, super space-time, um, not only do you have to give a bunch of numbers, um, uh, a time, an event in seconds, and some position that it took place uh, in meters, but you also have to provide some other numbers which are not measured in using ordinary commuting numbers, but are measured using numbers uh, that anti-commute with each other. So numbers A, B, C, which have the property that A times B is equal to negative B times A. So these, these funny numbers um, have the feature that uh, A times A would have to equal zero. That's going to be important in, uh, uh, in how it uh, ends up solving uh, uh, the problem. But very roughly speaking, the uh, picture is that uh, we have our normal dimensions that we know and love, three dimensions of space and one of time, but there al there's also some quantum dimensions um, and if we had an electron that moved in the quantum dimension, it would look, it's, it's a projection in our space, would look exactly like the electron. It would have exactly the same uh, properties, except in s some details what, what, what would be different. That this electron spins, for example, the spinning is responsible for why uh, uh, magnets exist. Um, its partner doesn't spin, so its partner wouldn't be magnetic. This guy's magnetic, its partner wouldn't, be, wouldn't have uh, um, wouldn't, wouldn't, be, wouldn't make magnets. Um, but otherwise, there would be exactly, literally exactly the same. If supersymmetry was a perfect symmetry of nature, then everything would be doubled. Once again, this is exactly like the antimatter story, right? There would be an extension to our ideas of space and time. Now, instead of putting space and time together to space time, we're taking space time itself and putting it together with uh, some, some, some new kinds of space time variable. But once again, uh, we, would have, um, we would have partners. 
Now you can ask, why is there only one partner? Why aren't there tons of partners? Um, if these were ordinary, uh, uh, some ordinary dimensions, you might imagine this guy can move in that dimension with any old velocity that it wants, and so its projection would look like particles that have many, many different masses. This energy would change. So the projection would look like particles that have many, many different masses. Well, the reason there's only one of them is this peculiar fact that a squared is equal to zero. You can't take more than two steps in this orthogonal space um, because of this funny feature of these uh, anti-commuting numbers. So there's really one partner for every particle that we know and love. They have silly names because these things were invented in the 70s. So the partner of the electron is the selectron. The partner of the photon is called the photino, and so on. Now, let me tell you how this solves, how, how this solves the problems. Um, ah, but I also, the, th this is the picture of supersymmetry was an exact symmetry of the world. It isn't an exact symmetry of the world, otherwise we would have seen all these guys uh, already. But again, like everything else that we've seen, uh, it really looks like the long distance world has some accidental differences between, uh, that, are, that are obscuring the fundamental similarity between, uh, between the interactions. We saw it already in going, seeing how the standard model worked, all these, um, all these different interactions, these stick figures that said that all the different forces were basically the same. That fact only became apparent at short enough distances when, when trivialities like the masses of these particles, um, the, or the difference between the mass of these particles could be neglected. Um, the, those things are trivialities from the short distance point of view. Of course, they're everything from the long distance point of view. But anyway, at, su at sufficiently short distances, this should be the picture. But in order to see these quantum dimensions are there, you've got to go to some sufficiently short scale. So let's say that sufficiently short scale is 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Okay, this is not a random distance. Uh, um, this is associated, well, remember, this is the, the weak length we're talking about. But imagine it's any, any scale you like. Um, let's just call it uh, 10 to the minus 17 here. At long, at long distances, you don't see the quantum dimension. You see these big fluctuations. Great. But then when the size of this box gets small enough that you see the quantum dimension, something new has got to happen. Something pr uh, perhaps I didn't emphasize is that there's supposed to be some complete symmetry. Uh, the reason this is called the, uh, th this is a symmetry between uh, ordinary space and, these, uh, and, and quantum dimensions of space. Uh, um, well, th there's supposed to be a complete symmetry between them. So uh, that means that anything that's, happening, anything that's happening in the ordinary dimension should also be happening in the quantum dimensions. But that means that you can't have huge fluctuations in the ordinary dimensions. Huge fluctuations in the ordinary dimensions would have to be accompanied by big fluctuations up and down in the quantum dimensions. But that's impossible, because you can't take more than one step in the quantum dimension. Okay? So that basic fact tells you the only, way this, uh, the only way this can be consistent is, in fact, if there's no fluctuations at all, or if these very big fluctuations are simply removed as you make the box smaller and smaller. That's exactly what happens. In fact, this argument is correct, and it does remove these very violent fluctuations of the vacuum. Now, uh, in order for this to solve any of our problems, it has to happen early enough. It has to, uh, if, if we saw these quantum dimensions at 10 to the minus 29 centimeters, it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, it wouldn't help us understand why, uh, why when the electron moves through space, it, 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 can, it, it bangs into this condensate every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. We would still wonder why there aren't huge fluctuations down to 10 to the minus 29 centimeters. For this very big idea to solve our problem, these, this quantum dimension should be showing up right around the corner. So it's not our desire to make life exciting that says that we should see this showing up right around the corner. If it's to give this big answer to this problem, at least a partial answer to the problem why there's a macroscopic universe, then this has to show up next door. So let me just end by telling you how we would see these things uh, at, uh, uh, in uh, experiments. So um, here is an aerial picture right outside uh, Geneva. Those are the uh, Swiss-French Alps in the background. And of course, you don't see this red ring uh, um, from the sky, but, uh, but uh, 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 deep underground beneath where this 28-kilometer uh, circumference, 27-kilometer circumference ring is, is a beam. And around that beam, um, we accelerate protons going around one direction. Uh, and going around the other direction uh, at extremely large energies, around 1,000 times the rest mass of the, uh, uh, 10,000 times the rest mass of the, um, of the uh, protons. 
And they're then made to collide with each other at a couple of places around the ring. Uh, and those collisions probe physics at these distances, around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. So here's a cartoon for what's happening. Here's a proton and another proton. Um, and again, they're accelerated to uh, uh, seven nines there times the speed of light, each one of them. Um, they smash into each other, and by making them go that fast, again, by the uncertainty principle, we need a lot of energy to probe very short distances. So that's why we've got to accelerate them so fast. Uh, they, they probe distances around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, and hopefully something new happens. Um, something new happens means that we're going to produce some particles and things that we, that we haven't seen before. Now, these particles that are produced uh, don't come out wearing name tags saying, I'm something new. In fact, they typically decay uh, very, very rapidly to ordinary particles. The time scale for the decay is around 10 to the minus 27 seconds. That's how long it takes light to travel this distance of 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And they decay into ordinary particles, electrons, muons, anti-electrons, uh, quarks. We don't see quarks in isolation, but we see large jets of particles uh, coming out associated with them. Uh, and really what's going on isn't the actual protons hitting each other, but if we look inside the proton, we see that it's made out of a, a bunch of quarks and gluons, and it's just a messy bag, around 10 to the minus 14 centimeter big, made out of quarks and gluons. What we're interested in is the head-on interactions between these quarks and gluons with each other. The vast majority of these times, these protons just rip each other to shreds, and nothing interesting happens. But, uh, but sometimes we have some very strong interactions and uh, um, head-on interactions and things, things come out. Right. And the things that are come out are observed in these gigantic detectors uh, that surround the collision regions. Um, uh, the reason the detectors have to be so big is the particles are coming out very, very fast. And you just have to stop them. Just stopping them forces uh, uh, is, is a large part of what makes these uh, uh, detectors so gigantic. So I'll, I'll just, uh, just take a couple of minutes to tell you how this would show up uh, at the uh, LHC. So let's say we take these two protons, we smack them into each other, uh, and at high enough energies, uh, we might be able to pop, them, pop some of the quarks off in there and make them move in the quantum dimensions. So they would look like we're producing these super partners of the quarks, these squarks. But again, they don't uh, come out telling us I'm a squark. They very rapidly decay. So this squark might decay to an ordinary quark and the super partner of a photon, the photino. This squark can do something more, more complicated, um, has, have, suffer a more complicated chain of decays. And what we end up seeing in these detectors are these visible particles in red, or things that go out, whiz out really, really fast, they're captured by the detectors and we see them. Uh, and we try to infer from the pattern of what came out uh, that this is indeed what was going on. Now there's something very notable here. These photinos uh, are, just like the photon, have no charge. They're, relatively speaking, much, much more massive, but they're very feebly interacting with the, with the detector. They don't stop in the detector. They completely escape. And you would notice that they completely escape just because you would see there's some energy and momentum missing from the event. Now, that's very interesting, uh, but I don't have time to talk about it. But uh, from a completely different side of our field, uh, at very, very large distances uh, in the universe, there's evidence for the need of some dark matter that makes up most of the mass in the universe. And if you ask the cosmologist what it would take uh, if you were to synthesize this dark matter in the Big Bang, what properties would it have to have in order for it to work um, in the most conservative way, then they would say you need some particle that's neutral, its mass is around hundreds of times the mass of the proton. In other words, particles almost identical in properties to the photino that we're just talking about. And that's not something that's being put into this theory. It's really, it's really, it's, it's a natural prediction. Uh, that, uh, that you would have these stable particles lying around that could well constitute the dark matter of the universe. And if that's the case, there's a whole suite of experiments over the, over the next uh, decade that are going to be looking for dark matter directly, in deep underground caverns, indirectly looking for signals that they might be out there in the galaxy, they can annihilate with each other, they could give rise to very high energy uh, photons, uh, antiparticles, and so on. But one, one way, very directly, is we could actually just make it at the LHC. The LHC could well be a dark matter factory. And if it was the Photino, it would be poetic because the dark matter would actually be light moving in the quantum dimension. 
So uh, finally, um, how will we actually know? This is, a, uh, this is a cartoon that any experimentalist in the audience would kill me uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, for presenting. But this is very roughly how we're going to find out uh, what's, uh, what's going on at the LHC. Um, there's a whole suite, any, any process, we're, we're colliding particles uh, together, very high energy particles are coming out. And most of the time what happens is just standard good old known physics. It's just known physics is perfectly, perfectly in principle well understood. It's not in principle what we're interested in, but it completely dominates what actually happens. Um, but the reason we have any prayer is that these new particles that we're making uh, have relatively high energies, have high masses. And the rates for, for standard processes fall with energy. But the rates for making these new particles will have some characteristic mass scale associated with them. So very roughly, you would start looking for blips above this big background of known physics at high enough energies. Just to give you an idea of the amount of a needle in the haystack, uh, which is involved with this, the rates uh, are, are, are as follows. There's roughly a billion collisions per second. Okay? That's roughly a billion collisions per, per second at, at the LHC. Um, roughly 10 top quarks a second are going to be produced. Um, this is remarkable because the top quark, 14 of them were discovered in 1995 <laughs> at Fermilab after seven years of running. Okay, and the previous generation of experiment, uh, its entire purpose in life was to, one of its entire purposes in life was to discover this particle. It did so after seven years. 14 of them was enough uh, to qualify for a discovery. Now we're going to be making them 10 times a second. So that's the, the maximum in experimental particle physics is yesterday's discovery is, uh, is, uh, is today's background, is tomorrow's calibration. So, um, uh, so anyway. Um, and on the other hand, the kind of these super partners, this kind of, this sort of physics, I mean, if there, if there are squarks out there where they should be, we'll be making about once a minute. Um, so that's a nice human time scale. It's a reasonable rate to be making them. But you have to compare it to these gigantic numbers. So this is how well you have to understand all of this to be able to dig these things out. It's a real, uh, it's a challenging and very interesting needle in a haystack problem. Um, but of course, uh, people have been thinking about it for a long time. So anyway, uh, uh, let me just uh, end um, by saying that uh, you should really st stay tuned. We, we really are making steady progress at, on at least some of the, the deep theoretical questions. And very excitingly, uh, we are now in the epoch where there's a real chance that we'll get a lot of uh, new data that might uh, 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 guide our search. And it's really an amazing time for doing physics. Thanks a lot. <laughs>